Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jeff Liebenson of Liebenson Law in New York and president of the International Association of Entertainment Lawyers. It's great to see so many familiar faces here. Um, very pleased to have such a good crowd on such a rainy morning. I saw the seas are rising and they're busily constructing a seawall outside and I'm assured we're safe at least until after this presentation, so thank you for coming. Um, we're gonna be discussing today digital rights and cross-border issues. And we have a very distinguished panel of experts that I'd like to introduce to you. We have at the far end, Anne-Marie Pecoraro, a partner at Turquoise Alkea in Paris. Next to Anne-Marie, Marcello Goianas, the founding partner of Murta Goianas in Brazil. Next to Marcel, we have, Mar Marcelo, we have Andrew Jenkins, who's executive vice president of Universal Music Publishing. Um, head of the Asia Pacific region and industry affairs, as well as the newly re elected chairman of the International Conference of Music Publishers. And to my immediate right, we have John Rudolph of Music Analytics in Los Angeles. And John was the former head of Bug Music, which he successfully sold to BMG Music Publishing. Now, I'd like to set the stage for our discussion with a brief description of the background in Europe and how we got into the current situation to frame our discussion. Each country in Europe has its own national copyright law and traditionally rights holders administered their rights on a country by country basis. Back when most music services operated in single markets, this worked just fine. However, with the arrival of the internet, enabling services to engage in multi-territorial exploitation, the need arose for more multinational licensing solutions. In 2000, the collection societies adopted reciprocal representation agreements, which provided that for the online world, performing rights could be licensed society to society um, under the Santiago Agreement for Performing Rights and the Barcelona Agreement for Mechanical Rights. And these agreements authorized multi-territorial licenses for online exploitation of musical works. The societies notified these agreements to the EC for validation, but in 2004, the commission considered the agreements to be improper restrictions against the creation of a single European market. And they set them aside. The commission found that the national exclusivity provision of the agreements that provided that the rights had to be licensed by the society where the licensee had its economic residence was the problem and, and violative of European law. So the Santiago and Barcelona agreements were terminated and that was an early effort to establish a one-stop shop that failed. Then, in 2009, the European Commission issued a key ruling in the CSAC case, a case which arose when the broadcaster RTL applied to GEMA, the German Author Society, for a pan-European license, and GEMA declined to grant the rights. The Commission ruled in favor of RTL, holding that tra the traditional reciprocal representation agreements signed by the CSAC societies were anti-competitive because they limited the ability of collection societies to offer their services outside of their own territory. And they encouraged the rights, older, rights owners to be able to authorize a single society to engage in pan-European licensing. So what were the consequences of that decision? The European collection societies changed their membership rules so that they could engage in pan-European licensing, and this was expected to result in the emergence of probably a small number of powerful societies that would dominate European licensing. However, the large music publishers reacted by taking control of their own repertoires, and they set up their own licensing uh, entities. The first to do so was EMI, which joined forces with PRS in the UK and with GEMA in Germany, and they created an entity called CELOS, which had the exclusive right to do pan-European licensing of EMI's Anglo-American repertoire. 
The other major music publishers all followed and set up their own entities. And since these pan-European arrangements license only part of the repertoire, the Anglo-American, for digital use, this meant that a digital service provider had to not only deal with those entities, but they also had to go society by society, country by country, to obtain the rights to all of the local repertoire. So what was intended to consolidate and aggregate the rights wound up fragmenting them and requiring more deals, not less. So what resulted has often been called chaotic and a licensing labyrinth. Uh, in 2011, the commission made another attempt to address this in its latest effort to streamline European licensing by issuing a proposed EU directive overhauling collection society procedures and permitting only societies that achieve certain goals to engage in multi-territorial licensing. So with that as the background, I'd like to get to the current state of play in international digital licensing. Okay, well, off to a good start. Um, Anne-Marie, I'd like to start with you, um, you know, with that setup about Europe and you're from Paris. I know you've been reviewing the directive and, you know, what is the status of the European directive and where is it leading us? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, it has been a very long story until the Commission has prohibited the membership clause and the exclusivity clause. And today we have a draft of, of directive uh, last November, the, the Council, the European Commission and the Parliament approved a proposed directive on collective management for copyright and related rights and multi-territorial licensing of rights in musical works for online uses in the internal market. I mentioned uh, the scope because, for instance, it doesn't uh, cover uh, music in broadcasting. It's only for online uh, digital um, services. And uh, the directive should be formally adopted by the parliament this week and a vote in plenary is scheduled today, I think, so it's almost the end before it's, it will be adopted. And once it will be published, um, for the moment it's planned that the member state will have one year to transpose it. And after this, less than three years to come back with a report to, to show uh, it has been taken into account. So uh, the, the directive uh, is supposed to facilitate the licensing of work. And the, the, the main idea is uh, to fight against the fragmentation of uh, the repertoires. The repertoire. uh, as long as when you're a uh, right owner, the fragmentation make it more difficult to bring your repertoire to the public. And uh, of course, when you're a digital service provider, it's extremely difficult to obtain uh, rights and to negotiate, especially if you're not um, a, a big one. And uh, the last was for the public and the users. Uh, the goal was to uh, enhance diver diversity and access to a uh, large uh, offer. So um, the three uh, topics are uh, first, the three goals of the directive are first to increase the transparency and efficiency in the functioning of copyright collective management organization with a lot of roots. Uh, and uh, second, to reinforce the members' rights, and then to facilitate the granting of multi-territorial licensing of authors' rights in online music. Um, if I can say a few words about the members' rights, because so, uh, as we said, the Commission first has prohibited the membership clause. It means that bef before, and so the recent situation was that if a uh, right owner was the member of one collective management company, uh, another collective management company in another country could refuse uh, 
the, this, this member, but now it's no more the case. The right holders will be entitled to different rights to, to, uh, um, among, uh, and also to um, be able to be accepted in a new collective management company and to withdraw for another one within a reasonable delay. And uh, the requirement to become a member should be more clear and uh, more objective. And uh, uh, once a member is a new member in a collective management company, now the rules uh, protect more the new members with mechanism of uh, participation in the decision making process. For instance, if you come for, from a foreign country, you're supposed to be more protected uh, being involved in the decisions and um, in, the, in the process of uh, decision making. So, uh, perhaps I can uh, add something about the multi territorial um, licensing. So, are we, are we, uh, as you understand, instead of the reciprocal uh, agreement existing before, now one company is supposed to be able to give multi territorial licensing. Uh, cases already existing are one you have mentioned with CELAS and also Harmonia, and we have three or four cases, uh, kind of uh, uh, group or joint venture of uh, collective management organization who are organized to give multi territorial licensing. Uh, a smaller collective management company can also ask to another one to give uh, licenses for its repertoire. It means if, if one, uh, one uh, collective management company in a country can go to ask to another one in another country, which could be biggest or with a bigger organization, to give licenses on both repertoire. Uh, there is also a clause in the draft of directive allowing right holders to give directly licenses if ever, in a certain delay, after one year, uh, the collective management company has not organized the multi-territory uh, licensing. Uh, so, just want to not give all the details, but mention the, the three examples uh, we have today. With uh, You have certainly heard about the Alliance Digital, the CELAS, Jeff has uh, mentioned, and the Harmonia. Uh, we, which is uh, uh, already existing and has already uh, negotiated and uh, closed uh, multi-territorial licensing with important uh, digital service providers. Thank you. Um, Andrew, can, I, can I say please. a few things? Because I think some things have been missed having spent the whole time in Europe going through this and I just want to clarify a couple of things. The right to withdraw rights existed from 1970 uh, with the Gamer Categories Agreement. And actually, pan-European licensing has been taking place on mechanical rights with the major record companies since 1979. So these weren't new developments. It sounds like they came about because of the internet. No, there was something called the CAN Agreement which dealt with pan-European licensing of Anglo-American rights to the major record companies. The, what happened, what was different, was only that there were more services requiring multi-territory licenses. That's the only difference. The actual legal structure was in place back in the 1970s for this to happen. The withdrawal of rights is enshrined in the Game of Categories Agreement, and all that happened was that there were adjustments because of that. In fact, the Barcelona Agreement was illegal because it assumed rights that societies didn't have. Because collection societies being national only were granted national rights. So they were not able to grant each other multi-territory rights. This is why there had to be a change in the system. It was when you, and, and if you think about it, let's, let's, if I go a thousand feet up for a moment, and you can think about whether you need, do you need the global repertoire licensed on a national basis throughout the world in 225 different collection societies? Or do you need the national repertoire licensed globally? Guess what, it adds up to 225 whichever way you do it. So there's nothing changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. There's a lot of people with vested interests in collection societies principally 
uh, making a big deal about how it's fragmented the repertoire. No, it hasn't. It's either 225 licenses or 225 licenses. Nothing else has changed. You know? Now, what we have been trying to do, and the whole reason for setting up these separate organizations, and I, I, can't, I won't talk for Cellas or Paycol or Pedal, but I will talk for the Universal one, it's slightly different, in that we didn't leave the society network. If you think about it, Universal had a bunch of national agreements with collection societies, giving them national-only rights to their repertoire. We changed this and gave one collection society pan-European rights. There was only one, so there was only one who had them, which was SASEM. We didn't leave, we don't have a separate vehicle. We, there's something called deal. It doesn't exist, it's not a legal entity. We're a member of SASEM. And we have an agreement with SASEM uh, to, to manage the rights. So what's, what, what really is happening with these things is trying to get from the situation in Europe, which we had, which was 28 uh, <coughs> countries, to get them from require for digital services, instead of having to go to 28 places, to create hubs and bring it down from 28 to a smaller number. The very first deal we did with SASEM on this basis was open to all collection societies in Europe. And Armonia is the first real attempt to bring in a number of collection societies. So we now have a digital hub in Europe, Armonia, which is uh, not only five collection societies, Sabam, Artijus, CI, Sigai, and, and SASEM, but also includes the Universal Repertoire and the Sony Latin Repertoire. So in, if you like, we're reducing the number of places a digital service has to go. It ha the fragmentation hasn't increased the number, it's actually reduced it in Europe, because you can get a deal that previously you had to go to five different organizations for, from one place. So we've gone from 28 to 23. I, what the Commission is trying to do in the CRM directive is to take us from 28 to about three or four. And I think that's the objective. We want to simplify licensing. We want to create big hubs. But they don't, they're not organized on a national basis anymore because that takes us back to 28. We can't get over that. So the only way is to forget about the national basis and think about other ways of licensing. And that's what I think is happening in Europe. And it's very interesting for, for the music business. We should be very proud of ourselves. You know, less, the commission uh, conducted a study over the last two years called Licensing for Europe. And they looked at all the, all the licenses that are granted for digital services in respect of all different types of content industries. And the industry that came up with a completely clean bill of health saying you are doing everything possible to grant licenses in the right way was the music industry across the board. Uh, there were problems in other areas. We were given an absolute clean bill of health. And I, thought that, I think that's something to, we should feel pretty pleased about. Now, admittedly, the CRM directive requires people to go further, but that is what we wanted to do back in 2005 when Tilman Luder introduced his uh, recommendation on online licensing. So I think we've come a long way. With Armonia, we've got what, what did require five licenses down to one, and we need to go further. I think it's interesting because when you, if you've been part of the music industry a long time, you had, you understood the lay of the land, you knew what deals were needed, you knew some deals took time, other deals were simple, and as Andrew pointed out, you know, there were a certain number of, of connections you had to make to obtain the rights and you knew where to go and you would do it. But with the advent of the internet, we have other people that weren't in the traditional music industry. They come in and they have different expectations and they think everything should be very simple. There should be a one-stop shop. Everything should be automatic. And that isn't the way the industry has functioned in the past. So really the debate is largely around should we adapt and change? Is the way we've done it before always you know, fine enough? Or should there be some, something in between? And that's really what we're all, I think, trying to find out. Hey, Jeff, there is a, so the efficiencies and the practicalities of the licensing mechanism were as part of the discussion, right? There was another discussion, the subtext of, this, of the discussion that was also going on was, this is from an Anglo-American perspective as, as far as repertoire was, why are we paying so much money to all these societies over the world and we don't know how much money is starting the first dollar before it gets to us? And, and that was a very big fracture point, if you would. It was like, okay, hold on. We finally got a little room and it's called digital. And so 
as a, I may be stating the obvious, but as all this was going on, that was the subtext of the conversation that was going on too. We're like, oh, perfect. We can license all these DSPs across Europe, one place, we'll know where the money is. So I'll speak from an independent perspective. The, the problem was if you got the repertoire, you can go cut your deal and get a great rate. Everybody else has to carry the weight of still the cost of that entire society infrastructure that's happening. So there was a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll say the COBOL deal with STEM is a, is a good example. We tried it, we started that process at Bug with STEM to try to help them understand what the issues were. Uh, the relationship that Universal has with SASM is a little different than that relationship in the sense that, well, I shouldn't say in that one, but in the sense that being a member was, was always something that was not really what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was say, let's have a business relationship essentially versus just be all thrown in. So long story short, there's a big commerce element that's going underneath this. And then when you really step back with all the DSPs that, that operate on a worldwide basis, all they really want is just a license to do what they do. That's it. So I think ultimately, if you look out five years, maybe 10 years, we'll be in a place that you know, that's worldwide. You're seeing it happen in the Asia Pacific. Um, you're seeing it happen in different places where, call it what you want to call it, but it will, you know, I'm just going to say there will be a contract, and that contract will be you can do this and you can do it anywhere and pay me. That's simple. Um, it's unfortunate on some level because there's so many good things that do come out of the society infrastructure um, that have to do with, to me, you know, we're all here because we're in, you know, no matter what you do, but you clearly have to have some love of music. So there's so many good things that happen as a result of you have money that are, is taking, if you would quote unquote, as a fee, um, that build and still promote the arts, the art element of music. But it's a big commerce engine, and that is going to get more and more efficient, and that efficiency is going to mean more dollars getting back to the source. Marcelo, um, we haven't touched on Latin America yet, and you're from Brazil, which has 200 million people, 600 million mobile bro broadband users. Um, it's a huge market and very important. Fill us in a little bit what the market is like from a rights clearance perspective, what the lay of the land is. Yes, I'm, I'm very impressed to hear that uh, in European level, you have been improving a lot in obtaining a one-stop or three-stops deal, uh, shop deal, which is um, something that we are far from obtaining in terms of Latin America licensing uh, of music. Of music. Um, I'm speaking for Brazil, but uh, I would say that in Latin America, the, uh, the scenario is pretty much the same that happens in Brazil. You still have to clear uh, the rights per territory, per country, and we're talking about um, uh, from Mexico, from, from Panama City to, to Ushuaia for more than uh, 50 countries. I mean, it's a lot of countries to, uh, to clear. Um, in Brazil, uh, you have to clear the rights, the masters per label and the publishing rights. Uh, although you have an association that, that uh, takes the role of uh, negotiating directly with the publishers and artists and associations in some cases, um, it's been doing a great job in the last years. It's called UBAM. Uh, in the past, you had two publishing uh, societies for this kind of deal. Now you have one for digital licensing. Uh, this association needs to, to get in touch with all the artists or publishers or associations or individuals to, uh, to obtain the rights to license to an aggregator, to a platform, and then to, uh, to sell music. So it's, uh, it's really tough. Um, hundreds and hundreds, thousands sometimes of individual uh, players that, uh, that are interacting this, in this environment. And, uh, and this is uh, part of uh, what Tom Jobim used to say, uh, the famous artist Tom Jobim used to say that uh, Brazilian, Brazil is not for beginners. And it's, it's true, it's true, it's true until today. Uh, after 15 years of the enactment of the DMCA in America and also of the uh, Information Technology uh, Directive from in Europe. We are now 
trying to pass a legislation, a federal legislation that uh, regulates, I don't like to use the real word regulation, but that uh, provides for some um, provisions in terms of internet related issues. So uh, the role of the liabilities, liabilities of ISPs, um, net neutrality uh, agreements related to digital environment. So those issues have uh, since the the boom of internet in early in mid 90s uh, has have been only analyzed in terms of legislation today and the legislation has not passed yet it's still under discussion so uh, i'm very uh, sad to say that we are a bit far from that uh, however uh, the market in brazil the economy uh, the social differences are improving a lot in the last years in the last 10 years i would say that we have developed something that we didn't uh, do in the past 50 or so. Uh, it's, been, it's been a real democracy since uh, mid 80s. Uh, the economy has been growing uh, seven, six, five, now two and a half percent in the last 10 years. And uh, for those who are professional, who take care, who, who have, of course, good uh, professionals involved from attorneys to managers to, uh, to, uh, to CEOs to uh, representatives, it's a very, very uh, profitable place to, uh, to engage. But for digital licenses, it's too difficult. So, so what do you do if, um, if Brazil is not for beginners? And it sounds almost impossible to license everything. Um, in the United States, if you don't license everything and you use everything, there's a risk of statutory damages, which is highly risky. Do you, do you have that sort of liability exposure in Brazil? We don't have the statutory damages or the, um, or the punitive damages that you have in the US, but the, the, uh, Brazil is a civil rights country similar to Germany and France. The origin of the civil rights is very similar to the German system and the French systems. So uh, the principle of liability of uh, damages is the, uh, what I call in Latin restitutio in integrum. It's the entire reimbursement for the damages that have been, that have been suffered. So, um, you do have moral damages, that is pain and suffering damages, that also applies for corporate uh, organizations. That's the, uh, the uh, what we call the objective honor of the organization, the image rights, the credibility of the organization that can be harmed in case um, violation occurs, infringement occurs. But the damages are far away from uh, what you know from the US system in terms of punitive and statutory. The, uh, the, um, the awards that, you, that uh, uh, owner's rights primarily uh, search is, uh, seek is uh, an injunction relief to, uh, to bar for the infringement and also damages at the end of process that can amount to everything that the uh, infringer has obtained with the infringement, uh, plus interest rates and, and, and attorney's fees. Andrew, as we continue our tour around the world, could you um, explain to us a little bit about the Asia-Pacific market? I know historically, sometimes there weren't even rights established for the authors in certain markets, and it's developed a great deal. What is the current uh, you know, level of, of rights that we find? Well, we, you know, again, it's, it's made, there's a lot of progress has been made. It's not as uh, advanced pro pro probably as Europe, and we're at the early stages of our uh, new arrangement with APRA to license on a pan-Asian basis. And this is, a, again, it's a, uh, you know, this is perhaps only a universal approach, um, <laughs> if I use that, uh, uh, in that we, in, we actually uh, won't do deals where other publishers are excluded or other operations. So this deal is open to all publishers. Um, I think that differentiates us from the approaches from some others. Um, the um, the a Asia MOU is an attempt to basically do what the European Commission is suggesting we do in Europe, which is to build a hub so that DSPs can get a license for 22 territories from just one place. Equally, you know, I don't suppose it's a surprise that uh, we would choose an, an organization like APRA, who we have a lot of confidence in them being able to handle something like this. I mean, there are some, there are some organizations, there are some collection societies in Asia that are incredibly efficient, and there are some that, uh, Perhaps, you know, on, to be absolutely honest, less so. Um, and one of them, that, you know, Indonesia, 400 million people, uh, a big market, and the society was thrown out of CSAC recently. Um, and you have to do an awful lot to get thrown out of CSAC, trust me. Um, 
the, uh, so there are problems in that region, and by, by collecting, at least for digital services, uh, a number of, hopefully, uh, society and publisher repertoires together, we can create a different environment, a simplicity for uh, the internet service providers who want to get licenses, the DSPs. It's an enormous change in the world. We, were, we started out, when we started on this process, talking to um, probably Apple, I guess, as they were the significant player many years ago and still are the most significant player in the market. And we were asked to find a way to reduce the number of licenses they would need to get around the world. And could we work at this? And, and, what, and we've been incredibly successful. If our Asia MOU works, and you know, it, it's at the very early stages, but if you were looking for Universal's repertoire, I remember what I said, there were 225 collection societies who are members of CSAC. Not all of them music, let's say 150, let's be generous, say only 150 have music. You would have to go to 150 places to license the Universal repertoire. Even though, of course, as a songwriter, when I write a song, I own the copyright for the world. It is the co co collection society system which has fragmented the rights. Each copyright is owned for the world. And a license could be granted once for, in respect of that copyright. So what we've done, though, we've looked at this and we've, we've managed to find people who are prepared to take on multi-territory licensing around the world. And we think that from, from probably around 150 licenses, we've got it down to around about 8 to 10 licenses to get the universal repertoire for the whole world. And that's an extraordinary uh, movement in, in five years. In the five years we've been trying to achieve that. That includes an Asian license, a pan-European license, an Africa and Middle Eastern license. It includes, in, in Latin America, it's a little more complicated, a license for Brazil, a license for Mexico, and through Sadaic in, in Argentina, and a collaboration of societies, a, a license for all of the other territories of Latin America, which is extraordinary to get them to all agree on this. So we have, if you like, three one-stop shops in Latin America, if you can imagine that. But, but the two big countries, Mexico and Brazil, still are separate. Um, but even going from 22 or however many countries there are down to three is a fantastic achievement if you're on the other side and having to do those negotiations and, 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 and make uh, contractual relationships to acquire music publishing rights. So we've gone from about 150 to about 10. That includes a separate license for jazz rack in Japan. So it's not just Brazil and Mexico. There are other parts of the world where you have to get separate licenses. But for all the rest, 150 to 10. That's pretty good going in five years. Uh, if you imagine that the societies have been going for 150 years, so to get them to make those changes within a short space of five years, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an achievement. And we should be fairly happy with that. I would still love to see more rights involved in those, because you, know, you cannot stop a rights holder from saying, I'm just not going to do it. Right. It, it's, it's not easy because you have, Andrew, as you mentioned, if you think about it from 30,000 feet, a single songwriter writes a song. He could grant the worldwide rights, or she could. And if that songwriter signed with the Universal, Universal could grant worldwide rights to that song. But in the traditional business, the collection societies collected all the rights, and a user could go to one society in their market. It was so much more efficient than having to go to Universal for that one song, and maybe Sony AT for another song, and back to Universal for the other songs. So the collection societies made things more efficient in that context. But now that we're doing multi-territorial, everything has to be re-examined, and, and that's really the process that we're, that we're engaged in, is unbundling rights, rebundling rights. So Jeff, just to that point, what Andrew's saying, you know, one of the things I think it's really helpful, especially if you're writing agreements for songwriters um, or copyright holders uh, that you might represent, is to think about this for a second, okay? And again, I'm looking into the future, is everything actually that has to do with music, the performance of music, the sale of music, any enjoyment of music really is now measurable on a one-to-one -one basis, okay? That wasn't the case even, honestly, three years ago. How are we going to do general licensing? Like, if there's music being played in here, how, how would you do that? Well, I mean, let's, there, there are entities that are working on situations where reporting and general licensing is automatic, meaning, let's just be, Shazam two weeks ago released, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, or a week ago, two, just think about it from a practical basis. 
released an app that listens 24. It's on all the time. So if you're just walking through a grocery store, it's, you can look down your phone and it's picking up what song's playing. So how hard is that then for a society in Malaysia to get that reporting data that says this song was played so everything is now measurable? That leads ultimately to a transparent situation where no longer is it going to a box and you, nobody knows how it's going to get divided out. You know what is being paid for what is being played, right? So there's only two calculations at that point. First one is how much are they paying? The first one. The second one is who gets it split up? It's that you know. It's that simple. So all the work that Universal's been doing, others have been doing. It on some level, there's elements certainly that have to do efficiencies and you know managing, if you would, the economics of it. But ultimately, I mean, ten to one, you know, is where we're possibly going to be. And and you you have to think about it because there's a dilemma. Right, so we're seeing um, a lot of agreements now for songwriters, copyright holders, that are coming. That always in the traditional agreements in the U.S. had a carve out for the writer's performance share, um, and now that's not the case. You're seeing these agreements coming in, and, and that's it's a real initial visceral reaction. That's like no way in hell am I. You know, I'm gonna always be able to control that piece, but there is a real practical element to this. And that is, okay, are you going to be the one who's going to license that yourself then? You, are, you're going to be the one guy who's going to be, I'm going to pull my performance rights out of the society. I mean, let's be practical. I get it from, a, from a, a basis, you should be able to do whatever you want to do with your rights. That's the first decision. But once you make that decision to, you know, to exploit and, and uh, monetize your, your rights, then at that point, you want to have the most efficient path as everybody else. I mean, so um, I could keep going on a, a, what Amazon AWS has done for the world. Nobody really realizes it, but the, now the cost is so low for anybody to serve any stream, anything they want to do. It's like everything's moving so fast, and the rights really, I mean, are the drag. And But let me also be clear to say, please continue to fight and protect <laughs> those rights. That's a different conversation. Well, you, you referred to the theoretical, almost you know, purely theoretical possibility that a writer would pull their performance rights because how would they administer it? But I'd like you to comment also on one of the really hot issues in America, which is the pullouts of performance rights by major music publishing groups from the PROs. Um, there have been court rulings back and forth. Where are we? Where, where do you, you know, what do you think the impact will, of, will be of this? You know, it's a, it's a interesting thing. I mean, certainly, probably Andrew has like the real inside scuttlebutt. But I mean, watching it go down, I think I'm not going to name names, but the 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 pan European when that broke, everybody's you know mind started going. They're like, all right, how do we do the same thing in the U.S.? I mean, and and you, it's. It's an interesting situation because, again, economics are driving a lot of this. And if you, let me, I always like to tell everybody one thing. If you're, if you make a hundred dollars a year from a performance society, you don't know what, how much of that, I mean, what the gross was. You just know what you're getting, right? You got this kind of credit system and these different things that happen. If you make five million dollars a year from a, why should you pay the same rate? You, know, you don't. You just don't know it. I mean, what's happening is there's reallocations internally that have to try to balance some of that out, including people who get paid more than they earned, you know, even if you just went straight on the actual earning basis. So that, it's, it's having the same effect that, it, you know, that essentially was happening in Europe in pulling out and then going back in. It's changing it from being kind of a statutory relationship. And of course, we have to think about the consent decrees and how those come into play, because uh, that's an overarching issue in all this. But the you know, pulling out those rights then allows you essentially to have a commerce relationship. How much is this worth? You know, how, mu what's, how do, much does it cost you to provide these services to me, the rights holder? Right? So it gets complicated, which is interesting, because we have the consent decrees, uh, ASCAP and BMI, and then 
there's others that are less implied, but, and so you also have to think about, it was funny because, I mean, essentially Pandora was argue, arguing in court in the U.S., the same, different side of the same conversation. They were on one side saying, we want to have a straight commerce relationship. We don't need to go through societies, da, 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 da. That was in one case. In the other case, there, no, the rights have to continue to be in this because we have a license from that. So they were arguing both sides of the case. So, but what's happening again, you, we have to go through all these machinations to get to where we're getting to, and that is, hey, this is going to turn out to be a, a, um, a contract, a, a management, rights management deal on the terms that, that the rights holders want it to be on. And now, I'm not talking about the deal of Pandora, I'm talking about the, the society structure. Pro, one of the fears, my fears, is that um, the songwriter, the, individual, the underlying individual songwriter is the one that's going to get hurt in this, and here's why. It's because the professionals are going to pull out their rights. Right, the big guys, they're going to manage those. They're going to, and when I say pull them out, it doesn't mean that they're leaving the society. It means that they're going to get more, they're going to get more um, control, if you would, and they're going to enter into a deal that says, I'll, pay, I'll let you charge me this much to manage these rights for me, essentially. But the collective power that BMI and ASCAP um, have had, good, bad, or indifferent, essentially cost averages down. So if you're a little guy, you're getting moved up in pricing, and if you're a big guy, you're getting pushed down. Well, the big guys are changing that. They don't want that to happen. So by changing that then, what happens? The cost for the little guy is gonna go up, 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 up. So that's a, a side effect that means the societies have to be more efficient, and I will they'll tell you they are working on that. They're very, you know, there are several that are very forward focused in trying to make sure that the net effect doesn't kick down through to the uh, individual riders. But it's something for you, you know, for the lawyers in the crowd who are working with the, their songwriters or artists to be really, really focused on. It's like, how do I, you know, how do I manage that? Because, you know, BMI's agreement is just, and it's ASCAP agreement is effectively the same for every songwriter, but then it starts to change, you know, when it comes to the publisher level. Uh, this movement of pulling out, pulling out rights from the PROs, uh, in Brazil is also happening, but now based on federal law. Uh, it moved, it, this movement started like five years ago. Some important artists uh, just didn't receive a, a pen out of the performance that occurs in a theatrical exhibition, for example, film industry, and also some concerts, and decided to uh, pull out the rights specific for that event. Um, the sole uh, collecting society, the sole PRO in Brazil, called ECAD, is a um, uh, uh, applies some applies sometimes rates that are um, very high for the market. For example, in theatrical exhibition, it's 2.5 percent of the box sales office. Uh, for internet uh, websites, OSPs, it's from 4.5 4 to 7.5 of the gross revenues out of advertisement. So it's <laughs> it's quite a lot for the for the for the market. And uh, these artists, this. Uh, from independent to, to, to big artists have decided to, uh, uh, to pull out and negotiate directly with the, uh, with the sites and with the uh, arenas and all the, um, all the, uh, all the companies, uh, a flat fee for, for the performance rights and they have been doing a great job with that. Um, in parallel, ECAD suffered some actions in Brazil because of lack of transparency, uh, rates charge and other, other, other issues. And the new legislation has just passed in Brazil like six, month, six months ago. Uh, it's a new federal law, but to be regulated, the regulation is to come, uh, changing the whole system in terms of negotiating uh, performance rights. So now it's not a, a, a movement from the market uh, only. It's also authorized by a federal law that an artist can negotiate on only public, not only publishing rights, but also masters uh, directly with the uh, with the, uh, with the entity in, in charge of paying those rights. And that's happening in the US too. Yeah. Right. That's, it's, that's happening in the US as well. Because if you're, if you're a big artist and you either wrote the majority of your songs or, you know, or part of your songs, and you go into an arena, and, you're pay, and the arena is taking off the top, so you're the artist and the songwriter, you do your settlement at the end of the night, 
And you're like, what is this charge across the top that for publishing? I wrote the songs. Well, under the mandates, they have to do that. They have to pay it. The problem is it doesn't come back around, right? So there, so there's a the same thing is happening as well that people are saying, oh, well, can I carve that piece out and pay myself, right? Well, I see we have people in the audience from different parts of the value chain here, and I want to give you a chance to ask some questions. Um, before I do, I just wanted to ask the panelists one other thing. I mean, Andrew, I think, gave a, a, a really good explanation how this, the process is in many ways becoming simpler, less deals are required, then we have other factors, you know, influencing the market where there are pullouts and more deals are being required. Um, and I think about this from the point of view of venture capitalists or other investors in the industry that seem to have an almost reflexive reaction that, oh, the music industry is too complicated, it's too difficult to get the right, so let's not invest in new innovative music services. Um, are they right? Is it getting easier? Is licensing realistic? And, and what is, what's the future uh, looking like? Is it becoming more or less realistic? From, so I spend a lot of my time with consulting to private equity firms, for example. And um, from a digital perspective, in, the Silicon, in Silicon Valley, absolutely. It is, I mean, people are still making little bets, but they're like, what? no way. I mean, it's, you, if you're doing an infrastructure play that doesn't have anything to do with rights, absolutely. It's cool. I mean, they're like, yeah, can we make some money doing this? But when it comes to, like, I mean, anybody watch the innovation, the guys up here who are pitching their new startups? How many of those guys do you think actually had a license? I mean, n nobody had a license probably. And, and, and also, they certainly didn't have a license for their little you know, their videos, like corporate video, right? It's cool, it's fine, you know, that we have to, I think there has to be some, but from a, everybody is right, I mean, phobic, like you would not believe. I mean, it's like, I would say half the phone calls I get is like, or is what they're doing legal? Um, you know, which is always a question in of itself, but you know, so yes, the question is, they're scared. Are there things that we should be doing to, to change that that can be done beyond all the steps that we've referred to? But further to your last question, there is also the value of the technology. I think when uh, we advise a startup, we know that uh, the in investment is focused on, on the technologies they develop, and the technologies give uh, direct access to market and to public. And so I think this is what the investors are looking for, and uh, they think they will obtain licensing when necessary. You know, what's, Universal and uh, some other majors did a, a deal recently with a company no one's ever heard of, right? Which is cool. It's called Song Lily, and what they do essentially is we, the, from a publishing perspective, or wait, you can't get to. I mean, it's just not even feasible to get to all these licenses that come in, that for all these startups, people requesting rights. So they said, what is the minimum you would? I mean, you would charge to either get a catalog or a series of songs or whatever it might be for an app, right? Non, non, when I say non-music based, I mean, you know, there's two different things. So music based or non-music based. And, um, and it was kind of, it's, it's so, it's rudimentary, but it's really progressive in the sense that it's like, hey, let's, let's, let's get these people compliant. They have to pay, but let's get them in the chain so they can get out there and start creating things. Um, and I was, I had to tell you, I was kind of shocked that it, that it happened. Um, but it's video game focused and, and app focused. Um, and it's not cheap. I mean, it's like a minimum license, I think, is you know, like a grand. And, um, you know, I mean, if you saw these companies up here, a grand is like, for these guys, is, you know, a lot of money. So if we can, I think the industry has to clear out the bottom, you know, the, say call it the bottom 20% and say, you know what? We got to find some way to be okay with that, to, to encourage innovation. And look, I sat on the other side of the table. I watch all these guys come in all the time, and I was like, no, 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 no. But it's got to happen because it's happening anyway. And, and you see what it was up here. It was great, right? So we want to encourage all that. You never know what the next thing is going to be. This, 
there is one big hurdle, and that is among the major music companies is a request for equity, right? I mean, in serious equity. I'm talking about, like, as a pool of, of all the major companies, you'll hear anywhere from 30 to 50% of your company. I want 30 or 50% of your company. I mean, that's just not practical. There's no way to fund a business when you're giving it away. As I always say, it's like, you know, if you're buying steel for a car, you're not going to give 50% of your car company to, you know, the guy providing steel. So, anyway, but I would encourage, please be progressive when it comes to, you know, licensing to, to uh, new startups. It's a matter of being realistic. I remember in 2006, IAEO, one of the IAEO panels, Luis Nemeshkov from the U.S., mentioned uh, uh, an expression that I would, uh, I would last forever in my mind, that is the Googleization of copyrights. After the Googleization of copyrights, uh, the industry had to be a bit more flexible and tolerate some issues. I mean, it's not being tolerated with, but uh, being realistic with the, uh, the new reality. So um, for, for, for newcomers, for, for apps, for um, startups, it's, it's necessary to be, uh, uh, to be a bit more flexible. And the, and the attorneys have an important role on the, on the risk management and on the advice that, uh, that uh, and the opinions that uh, they have to render for these uh, this clients because sometimes they just, they just can afford uh, the traditional model to, to start up. I think being realistic, being knowledgeable and then being realistic on exactly how to navigate, knowing what you need. Maybe you don't need all the rights. Uh, rights holders are developing sandbox approaches where they're willing to license limited rights to limited portions of the catalog for startups to develop and get to the next step. So there are creative, you know, different approaches trying to be realistic in that way. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we, we can go a little way on, on that as an industry. But, you know, this is, a, this is quite a new idea that uh, for some reason someone should sponsor your startup. You know, it doesn't happen in any other business. If you decide to build motor cars, you don't get a reduction in the cost of tires. In fact, you get a cost a reduction if you build millions of motor cars, but not if you're just starting out. So the, the idea that for some reason you automatically deserve a discount is not true. And it's not true to under, to, to, for anybody who's involved in the music industry. You'll understand this. We deal with startups all the time. Every single new songwriter who hasn't released a record yet is a startup. We deal with startup businesses. That is our business, to manage startups. We manage startups all the time. And do you know what? They don't get a discount on the guitar. It's, it's really interesting. There's, there's some kind of requirement. And yet, licensing for Europe, the European Commission study over two years established that the music industry was licensing digital services properly. When other, when other industries weren't. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic, but I'm not that sympathetic. You know, it's like, come on, if you, if, if you don't know what the costs of getting into business are, don't get into business. Let's uh, take a few questions. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks. Uh, Joe Benzo uh, from the US. Um, not a lawyer, but I do work on the tech side and work with a lot of startups and a lot of artists. And you just mentioned that you work with startups every day as individual songwriters are startups. Um, what's the risk? Uh, a lot of what we're talking about, there's a lot of complication and it seems extremely ripe for disruption. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, do we keep with the same system? Do we change with the, the times? Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of, a lot of areas where there's, there can be disruption. One of the topics you guys are talking about is um, in terms of managing current catalogs and back catalogs and current major artists. But as the trend goes forward where there's more uh, tools available for individual artists, the next superstars, to do basically everything on their own in a really simple manner, to bypass uh, you know, PROs, to bypass labels, to do everything themselves, and then what you already see happening is uh, you know, artists starting their careers by just giving their music away online. They want to uh, get the exposure. And then you have things like uh, multi-channel networks on YouTube that are doing the management process for them. And I see a, a system in the, in the near future where 
you're just going to go to YouTube and the artists are just going to say, yeah, you can license my music for this, this, and this. And it's a one-click solution for the artists themselves and a very simple solution. Um, I guess you guys are talking about uh, also tech startups in terms of having the, te having the startups, music startups use the back catalog and licensing. But what about as the trend goes forward with, uh, with the new music catalog in the next five, ten years? Look, if you, if you want to see what I, th I think what the future looks like, look at all the, the I would say the majority of, of, of uh, songs that are in the aggregators, okay? In IOTA, or what was IOTA? The Orchard, TuneCore, on and on. Most of those people, when they go in, they click all rights, you, you can do whatever you want with it. Essentially, just make me money, right? They don't care. Now, the problem is obviously when you have a different parties involved where you, the song is not owned by the, you know, the artist or whatever it might be from that standpoint. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's gonna be, because there is a huge wave in that. Now, the thing is, those people now are jumping right into the, what I'd say is the traditional structure once they get to a certain size, and because there's the money. You need the money then to go to the next place. But yeah, no, I mean, in you know, the multi-channel networks, I mean, frankly, they're, they, you know, they got compliant because they got sued. I mean, and that was a carve out in the US um, deal that the professional networks, the multi-channel networks, it wasn't called that then, but those guys weren't covered under the original licenses. So, and that was a YouTube, just, you know, matter. They wanted it that way. But that's, be that's because, that's because the, the current system is set up where the multi-channel networks have to pay those licenses. That's but, right. They, they were supposed to bring content that was fully licensed right. onto the platform. But if the artists uh, coming forward don't make that jump and they just say, hey, we, can, we have all the tools necessary, we don't yeah. need to... Uh, we don't need to have a... Worldwide. Uh, yeah. Boom. Push one button, you're right. done. Exactly. That's what most of them are doing. I yeah. mean, that's it. Okay. I mean, that's... That, and if that wave, if you can just think about it, it's just a timeline, right? You got all those artists who are young and new, and that's the way they're publishing. Yeah. Not, I don't mean music publishing, but publishing to the web. As they move forward, they're going to be the masses that just blow past all this infrastructure. So, so is that an area where you guys are interested in, in working with those types of companies? Uh, or still trying to maintain uh, the structure that is currently in place, very complicated structure. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, we, ha we have to. If we're gonna simplify licensing, if you're a major digital uh, platform, digital service platform, you need to make sure you've got all the rights covered. Whether the, so you need to know whether the writer is inside the system or outside the system. At some point, you need to know anyway. So of course, in, if we're really trying to simplify the number of licenses, I mean, my wife is an independent artist, an independent songwriter. She happens to have a publishing deal, so her publishing goes that way. She doesn't have a record deal. She does it herself online. As she's a, it's a one artist record company. But of course, so that means that's another record company, a digital, because record companies aren't amalgamated in their licensing. That's another arm that a, a DSP has to go to. So of course we want to manage that process because we don't want to make getting licenses harder because even though artists will go down that route, and I think it's absolutely right they should, we need to somehow make sure that the services, when they get a license, know they're not going to be sued by anyone, and that includes one of those artists. Um, I, um, I just would like to jump in on this, talking about being sued. As a music lawyer, I get um, contacted quite a lot at the moment by the likes of Sound Reef and companies like that who basically just go to the source, they just speak to um, um, artists um, and signed artists and, uh, who are not even registered with collecting societies and they just license them and then they sell through streaming processes, they just sell the music to retailers so that they can just um, have the music in their shops or department stores or whatever. So um, do you think there is a legal risk for this type of companies because they are basically making these artists not um, going through collecting societies? Could there be a backlash for them, for these companies? It, it, it depends on the, on the territory, frankly. I mean, in, in, in the US, you can do it. I mean, if you sign your rights, all your rights, performance is in, and you could do it. Oh, I mean, they might not be happy with it, but you know, they can't do anything about it. In the U.S., they can. 
You're right. It's a, it will be a problem in some jurisdictions, as John says. I mean, there are some jurisdictions, India, Italy, where there is the monopoly on those rights is granted by government. It's under law. So, I mean, there's what we can do to change the, the law. You know, it's up to all of us to work together to do that. But if you, if you had uh, performing rights at the moment, you were a writer, and you didn't want to grant them to IPRS in India, you wouldn't have a choice. Yeah. I have a question here. Excuse me. Please. Out here, yeah. See, my name is Anil Vanwari. I'm from India, Andrew High. You were at Music Connects two years ago, three years ago. Uh, you know, are the PROs in the current form and the collection societies, are they kind of going to become less relevant going forward? Because yesterday, there was this young DJ who came on stage and said he's going to start streaming. So the sound exchanges are coming up. Uh, you know, you have a repository of millions of tracks online through uh, uh, DJ Spotify. Uh, then you have, you know, what I'm getting at is, are they going to become less relevant going forward? They're going to be different. That, exactly, they're going to be different. They have to think about their business differently. Still, the bulk of revenues coming through collection societies is based on national licensing, whether it's the licensing of bars and cafes and restaurants, or just licensing national broadcasters. That's the biggest source of revenue for collection societies. And that, for the time being, because it's hard to imagine multi-territory licensing of bars or cafes, I mean, that's kind of difficult to imagine. And, and even national broadcasters would resist multi-territory licensing of broadcasters uh, of, of themselves. You know, they, would, they would look for national, their own local society to license. So I think a lot of the business is going to be local and it will remain local, probably 90% of what they do currently. But there will be an element and an opportunity for some collection societies. It won't be all of them because they won't have the will to do it or that they won't have the technical expertise to do it. But there will, some of them will have an opportunity to expand into what I've sort of been describing as the hubs, those broader based collection societies that not only license nationally, but also license as part of a group of repertoires on a pan-European or even multi-territory or even global basis. The aggregation is the, is the thing. You, have, there, you know, the whole idea in the aggregation, so maybe there's only one eventually, but you, and maybe it's completely automated, but you, there still has to be the aggregation of all these rights all over the world in the one place that one per, the DSP or whoever can come in and actually get them. So, I mean, look, I think the next interesting thing, like intellectually that happens, is if one of the foreign societies goes to another, you know, like what happened on a micro basis in Europe, what if somebody shows up and say, you know, STEM decides they're going to start licensing the U.S.? I mean, I, I would love, I, I say love, I probably wouldn't love it, but I would love to actually see what happened. Like, I would love to be a farmer and see, watch it, go back and go, my former life, that's interesting. But, yeah, right. yeah, you know, in countries like India, we have, I mean, the, the, the collection societies are like beasts, like monsters, like Andrew told you. I mean, they have a rate card. If you're, doing a, if you're doing an event, if you're doing something online, they have a flat rate card. They don't care whether you have those audiences, but the rate card, they follow it, and you've got to pay that amount. So, uh, you know, we, from my perspective is that we see a future where, we, where, where there's a lot of flexibility, like you said, but that's not coming in as it's yet. It's coming. It's, it, it, it's like, I've known this man for 15 years, probably off and on. If you would ask us 15 years, we would have been like, ah, oh, it's, uh, like, it's grinding. Going, it's, ah, and you're it's still going, ah, you're not But going, it takes ah. time. I, I no. tell you, I guarantee to you, hopefully we'll be here in five years at this event, and you'll be like, hey, and then 10 years, it's going to be completely different. It's just, it's just happening. And actually, I'm surprised how ha quick it's happening now that it's actually happening. If you heard Mike, Mark Geiger, he said, please wake up. All your labels wake up. Or these guys are going to become dinosaurs. I don't, I don't want to talk about the label side of it because that's done differently. But the one thing I can give you a crumb of hope is that this deal I talked about earlier, the Asia Pacific deal, includes India. So that you should be able to get a license, there should be an alternative to IPRS, at least in respect of digital rights. For national broadcasting or any kind of general licensing, I'm afraid we're stuck with the national organizations for the time being. Thank you.
I, I think what's happening, if you think about the next five years, we've made so much progress recently, and you can see there's more to come, and every time there is progress, it disrupts. The, the word disruption came up. It disrupts one of the other established relationships, and then a barrier comes down, but another challenge arises, and we just have to keep working and working through this till we, I don't know if we'll ever have the perfect system, and things will keep changing, but it's, it's, it's definitely a space that's really going through evolution. Um, I hope we've sh shed some light on the various challenges and opportunities in the sp space of international digital licensing. The IAEL is very, very pleased to have presented this today. I want to thank you all for coming and thank our panelists. Thank you. Hey, could I just have a quick question? Uh, as, a, as, as the guy, a, a songwriter from Ireland, and uh, it's in regards to, I, I, I really get a sense that there's, depending on the medium, that the usage of music, there just seems to be such a disparity between uh, the value of the music. If you go back to your talking about your concert, seven and a half percent, you know, in terms of, you know, as a songwriter, I go, hey, that's brilliant because that's the value I put on, I put on music. But when you when you trans when you go across it, do you ever see a time? Because I think you referred to it earlier. It's I don't know. Is it working? Yeah. What oh, is? Great. Sorry, it's me. And uh, I'm a singer. I should know. But uh, um, it's just that do you ever see that? Albeit that you're you know you're you're going for the rights and that end of it. Do you ever see that there has to be a, a case for finding a value in advertising and finding a value in mechanicals for a track on an album and finding that there isn't such a disparity. And because I'm somebody that has songs in all medium, I write for other artists, and then I find that the percentage of payment through advertising, particularly in my country, is, is it, the value of the music in the medium is, is ridiculously lower than it would be in an album, than it would be if it was part of a concert. And I said, do you ever see that while, while you guys are lobbying for that, is there anybody gonna lobby for, hold on, this is the value of music, regardless of the, of the, of, of the medium, you know? Well, that's like, the fight that everybody sitting up here is doing every day um, is, to, I mean, on, everybody's interest is self-aligned in that in that sense, right? The problem is, is honestly, is you, and and I mean that sincerely in the sense that. So I also am chairman of a, a music production company called Lice Arts. We're one of the biggest, if not you know, the biggest when it comes to custom music for commercials. Okay, we had five, five, saw, or five pieces of score in the um, Super Bowl, for example, the other night. There are thousands of people who are undercutting us every day, right? And this is composers. So you guys are driving the price down because where's, in America, there used to be a union for the, the musicians, AFM. Well, the, re the remuneration from from the TV companies, the percentage is decided by them, not by the artist. No, 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 hold on. Here's what I'm saying is, we're fighting to try to keep that as high as we can, but the reality is, you can go non-union, you can do it, all these different things. There's, the artists have to get together and actually say, we're not gonna do it for less than this, collectively. But, the, the, I mean, I'm just saying in America, the AFM has been eviscerated because the artists have decided to go off and do their own thing. AFTRA and SAG in America are very strong. Very, very strong. But that's, I mean, I'm not saying that that's the sole issue, but to try to keep pricing, I spent a lot of time thinking about pricing. And it's like, to try to keep pricing as high as possible, everybody has to be able to hold. The, diff the thing is, if you're, just like somebody was saying, giving away music for free, uh, in a mixtape or whatever, if you're young and hungry and have nothing going on and you're trying to get heard, you're gonna do that. So the market is, is really driven sincerely by the suppliers and the writers and the artists are the suppliers and we try you know we try to keep it as high as we can i mean it's how we eat too yeah well i appreciate everyone's enthusiasm we're out of time but anyone who has further questions please come up and speak with us individually thanks again